Suave. I've been in my bag for a while, I'm invincible. Story of a young boss, grinding shit critical. Calling on my bros one time, cause you special. I had some hood dreams and right rounds for my mentor. Every target that I shoot is on point like a pencil. Different routes change relationships, I'm so sorry. Came up from the trenches and I made it, I say hardly. Now Bet Online remains your top spot for all of your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, and NHL are all in full swing. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. All righty, guys, we are back with another episode of the What's In Your Bag podcast presented by Bet Online. As always, I'm your host, Andrew Robinson. And before we get into our, our guest today, man, and give my guy a special, special introduction, man, y'all know we got to get the business out of the way, man. So before we get into the nitty gritty, man, I need you guys to stop what you're doing. Tap that subscribe button, man. Give us a thumbs up. It goes a long, long way, man, to getting this show out there to people who need to see it, man, and get this good word. If you're hearing this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, go ahead and give us a five-star rating. Drop a comment. Give us some feedback. You know, show us some love. It goes a long, long way. That was my boy Pull Up Tay on the intro. It's going to be him on the outro, man. Make sure you guys stream his music. One of the hottest up-and-coming artists out of the DMV. But without further ado, man, like I said, we have a special, special guest, man. This is somebody who I've been trying to get on the podcast for a minute, man. But you know, when you, you got some motion, man, you know, it's it's, it's stuff that got to be handled first. You know what I'm saying? So today, man, we are pleased to be joined by Tristan Forbes, man. He's a head of content, brand management, everything for Fred Van Fleet, also formerly of the Toronto Raptors. He's done a bunch of work in the NBA space with a bunch of guys, Serge Ibaka, um, artists, musicians, man. But Tristan, man, we're definitely pleased to be joined by yourself, man, on the podcast today, man. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you, my man. Appreciate you. Honestly, it took a while for us to get this done, but happy that we're getting it done, man. No doubt. No doubt, man. Now, I know, folks, you guys are going to hear this a little bit later, man, but as of today, man, it's Thanksgiving, man. So happy Thanksgiving, my guy, you know. Facts, from, facts. From love, 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 love. Man, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. First no doubt, like, no Thanksgiving doubt. on U.S. soil. First Thanksgiving on U.S. soil, like you said, man. So what you getting into today, man? So to be honest, I'm like probably going to just chill. We had a game last night. Uh, I might do a bit of editing, but I'm probably going to head over to Fred's house. His his first Thanksgiving in Texas because um, he was he was also playing for a Canadian team. So he celebrated Canadian Thanksgiving in October. Right. So going coming over here now, getting to have the actual Thanksgiving vibes, probably going to go over to Houston a bit. Yes, sir. All right. So now. What are you most – what Thanksgiving dish are you most looking forward to, man? Because, like I said, right. it's the first Thanksgiving in the States, man. So, uh, we got the good me, spreads over here. <laughs> let me tell you, since I got here to, like, Texas, I've been on, like, the Southern food kick. So, bro, anything that has candy ants. Honestly, I'll have candy ants as the main dish. Like, I'm not even <laughs> tripping on that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm really with the candy ants, collard greens. Um, I haven't had, like, catfish and stuff like that yet and all those other dishes, but – I'm kind of looking forward to trying them, you know what I mean? But I'm like, candy ams, that's my fix right now, bro. So anything <laughs> that I'm eating that, bro. <laughs> hey, listen, man, tell tell the chef, man, cook you up some nice fried catfish. You know, definitely need some uh, mac and cheese, too. Baked mac and cheese is my personal favorite thing dish, man. I love baked mac and cheese. Oh, I'm about to go ask for that, for real, for real. Hot sauce on there, woo! Oh, oh, oh <laughs> yeah, bro. That's a vibe, that's a vibe. So you said... Uh, Canadian Thanksgiving is October. What is like a uh, uh, Canadian Thanksgiving like as far as the food? Like, what's I know you like it's, it's got to be a little bit different, but what's the vibe? Yeah. As far as, like, is it? I know it's, it's probably a little bit different as far as what you guys eat and stuff like that. It's like to be honest, it's same principles, like being together with your family and so on and so forth. I think from like the food aspect, because Canada is such a diverse country. You know what I mean? Like to speak to it to a bit, Canada is the place where most like people immigrate to from like third world countries. So it's so blended, you know what I mean? There's no like definitive culture, you know? And I think like, we don't have that down South Southern culture where you're having like cornbread, mac and cheese, collard greens, you know what I mean? Like, so you'll have your turkeys and then, you know, you'll have family do some stuffing and like, you know, whatever like nationality background you're from, you might mix that into your Thanksgiving dinner. We're here like the staples or be like, let me get the Big Mac, let me get the, you know what I mean? Like, so on and so forth. So it's a bit different, but, like, same principles all in all. 
Okay, okay, valid, 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 man. Well, listen, I hope you get some good eats today, man. You know what I'm saying? 100%, I hope bro. I'm, trying to, be, I'm trying to be out and sleep by like five, six. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, sure. obviously, you're transitioning from Toronto to Houston, man. What is your early impressions on H Town, you know, from, from moving so far? Um, you know what? Like, I've had some friends uh, who lived out here before. Uh, a friend of mine is a close friend of James Harden. So um, he was tr sort of trying to give me the vibes before I got out here, like, you know, where to go, what to eat, like, who to talk to, who to know. Um, the diversity is there. Um, I think, like, the culture um, is definitely something I'm adapting to because Toronto is so multi-blended. It's like there's no definitive culture because we have so many backgrounds, so many walks of life. Where, like, Houston, you can feel like there's an actual definitive culture here, like, People move the same way. They talk the same way. They go to the same places. You know what I mean? And it's like, especially like of our culture, you know what I mean? Right. So like, I definitely um, find there are a bit of differences, but then there are also some similarities. Like it's great, uh, great diversity of food. You know what I mean? I find the food culture is amazing here. I've been like eating takeout for like a bit, like a week or two weeks now, just like trying to try everything I can. You know what I mean? But no, nah, man, it's cool. And I like, I like it, man. Like, I think, the biggest thing, obviously, people are going to say is the weather. You know, the weather in Toronto, like, you get all four seasons. Yep. And here, like, they don't say they'll get all four seasons, but right now they think it's, like, winter. And I'm like, bro, this is pretty warm, like, yeah. in comparison to what's going on in Toronto right now. Like, it's flipping cold back there, you know? So I'm just like, yeah, I'm trying to enjoy all the little small tidbits. I'm not sure if I'm going to stay here throughout the summer just because I heard it gets crazy hot so I might duck it and go back to Toronto in the summer but like you know I'm gonna try to figure out what my balance is and then go from there bro for sure for sure man have you got a chance to step out on the streets yet man you know H-Town I heard this is high vibrations out there it you is know? it yeah. is I won't, I won't lie to you bro I've gone to a couple places I've been to like where have I gone? I got I went to this restaurant called Kiss. I went to this place called Friends. Uh, LeBron had like a Lobos, uh, almost like tasting type vibe at at this place called Friends. Um, but because like I'm still like navigating the space, like I'm only going out if I'm going out with my tribe. You know what I mean? So unless friends like yo bro, we're going here, or like you know like some friends I have say we're going here, I'm gonna go. I'm not really like a solo street walker. I'm like, yo, if y'all if y'all valid, you stamped it, okay, we'll go. You know what I mean? Like, so, and I know people say, yo, Tristan, go out, go out. Houston's a nice place. People are nice people. And I think, like, Toronto is like that, too. Toronto, because I'm from there, I'm so comfortable just going, like, walking the streets by myself because I know, like, where to make a left or where to make a right and so on and so forth. But right. Houston's so big, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like you got to really know a destination to go to. And I'm, like, a being in the content space, we see, like, all these like food videos, like where to go try food or like where to go to like get groceries. So I'm like sitting on Instagram, like swipe, 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 trying to figure out all these fucking places to go to the shit. You know what I mean? But no, nah, that's cool, bro. I can't complain. Hey, so I got to rewind a little bit. You said you went to the place friends, the, Lo the Lobos party. Uh, LeBron was doing. How was that? Maybe we can't just, we can't just glaze. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> it was cool. Um, They had like a little, the Lakers played the Rockets maybe like a week or two weeks ago. And, um, Lobos just made Fred a, like a sponsor. They just sponsored Fred because mm. Fred is also part of the Clutch family. Right. So um, they just sponsored Fred. So they had a little um, we'll say like a outing of sorts, like a lounge just vibe. Um, but it was cool because it was like my first time really going out out in Houston, and then obviously like being in that basketball space. Like I don't want to say it was people like I didn't I didn't get to meet new people because like again like I met new people, but I'm still around people I'm comfortable with. You know what I mean? People like that I get to work with on a day-to-day -day basis or players I might know on other teams. You know what I mean? So it was cool, bro. It's a big vibe, man. Casually, you know, casually at Lobo's part of LeBron, man. That's <laughs> casual, casual, casual Wednesday, bro. Casual Wednesday, man. Must be casual. nice, man. Love it, love it. So I want to kind of get into your personal journey, man. Um, Obviously, like I said, you know, you had a, a, a long, you know, just plethora of experience, whether it's, working with the Raptors, now with Fred and Serge. I want to talk about your introduction into this content space, man. Take me back to, you know, what first allowed you to fall in love with the camera and, and creating content, and when you first realized that this was something that you wanted to take seriously as a career. Like, how, do, how did you first get into this space? Um, You know what? I attribute a lot of this to, um, I think, the development of phones. You know what I mean? I think, like, the way how far the phone has come and gone, it's like, 
phones megapixels are getting crazier. Um, I just think being a person of wanting to save moments, phones make you feel like you're that person. Every new phone, whether you're an iPhone user or a Google phone user, or whatever the case may be, they're trying to make people feel like they're a professional. You know what I mean? So I think like from the origin of phones where you're like, okay, I want to capture this. And like, don't get me wrong. Like I grew up playing basketball, you know what I mean? At a young age. And I had heavy influences being in Canada. I think like, if you think about my age in retrospect to the Canadians that are in the league, like we're all roughly the same age. So we were all roughly came up together. You know what I mean? From like, uh, Corey Joseph, to the Andrew Wiggins, to the Tristan Thompson of the world, like we're all roughly in the same age bracket. So like if you played basketball in Toronto at that time, specifically, you know what I mean? Like you all knew each other and you all um, got to a place where one person influenced the other. Um, for me, where the content I want to say sort of started is um, I always liked taking, I figured if my trajectory to play basketball for the rest of my life wasn't ideal, based off of injuries and so on and so forth. And I think everyone goes to that. It was more just from a standpoint of like, how do I stay around the sport? Do I go into like the medical side of the sport? Do I go into the PR side of the sport? And I was just like, yo, capturing just felt like so, so easy. Yeah. Um, I lived uh, with a, a close friend of mine at the time. Um, his name is Xavier Tamez. He played for uh, the Westchester Knicks for a bit. Yeah. So I got to sort of like be immersed in the sport at that point in time. So I was in New York for a bit. And then he went from New York to Greece. So I moved to Greece for a bit and I was out in Greece capturing and that was like complete culture shock. And I think like getting to get repetition and then sort of understand the game, ask the questions. Cause you know, I think a lot of the time, so I feel personally, most places and spaces don't respect you until you go somewhere, you do it and then you come back. Mm -hmm. So it was like when I was picking up a camera, like in my city per se, it's like you're sort of fooling around with it. Yeah. When people watch you on social media, they say, oh, you went there and you did it. And now you came back. Oh, you've got to be big time now. You know what I mean? Like, so I think it was a bit of that. And when I did get back from Greece, it was like, okay, there was a bit more respect. But I also had, I also knew a bit more about my craft. You know what I mean? Like I took the time to learn mentors and so on and so forth. And um, I sort of fell into doing like some stuff with Nike and like Foot Locker, um, a lot of productions. And then um, I met Serge. And yeah. then um, from that relationship, like it blossomed to where I'm at now. So I, I kind of want to ask you, first of all, footnote. Uh, so Andrew Wiggins and them was class of 2013. I'm class of 2014, right? Okay. So I used to watch that CIA bounce team with like yes. <laughs> uh, Andrew Wiggins and Eddie River Thomas and watch them go crazy. Like, uh, yeah. Like, crazy. <laughs> yeah, that was like, the, I want to say like my older heads would say like that wasn't the boom of Canada basketball, but I feel like biased because I feel like that was the boom of like Canada basketball. Like before that, you'll say like, you had uh, Tristan Thompson and Corey Joseph who were like the Texas guys right. and they went, you know what I mean? But I feel like that generation, that team specifically, like yeah. you had like three leaguers. You had Tyler Ennis who came in as well. You know what I mean? Like there was a whole lot of leaguers yeah. on that on the CIA bounce team. You know what I mean? So like you had a uh, Sim Bular um, who was seven, five, you know what I mean? Like the first people. And, and that's what makes up the diversity I'm talking about. Like yeah. you had an Indian seven, five kid, he went he to had, the league too. He got he drafted. The league too, exactly. You know what I mean. So there was so many league potential on that team, and that was I felt it was the first boom, and that created the whole like Shea, Nikhil, O'Shea Brissett, like that next wave. You know what I mean? It came from this wave. You know what I mean? So yeah, man. You know, especially for like us. I mean, I was I'm from Maryland, so for us in the states, we were seeing it as like, yo, Andrew Wiggins, CIA bounce. This is crazy. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um. So my question is, when you went out, when you were working with uh with Xavier. Was that just kind of like, yo, this is my homie. I'm coming to kick it. And like, yeah. were you guys working together? Like, yo, this is kind of like your first, like, I guess, gig where you're actually with somebody shooting the content, shooting content for a professional athlete. Or was it kind of just like, we're boys. I'm going to just come and pull up. You and know what? I think it was a bit of both. I think like most roles that like we compare like the Rich Paul to LeBron James or um, Tristan Thompson might have a guy. Or a lot of NBA players, they have a guy, you know, and a lot of these guys, we call them, I think, I think we try, I don't try to diminish their role by calling them a guy, but they, the inception of that is from a friendship. Yeah. I mean, so I think a lot of the time it's like, you, you're trying to figure out how you can exist in their world by being an asset and not just being the friend, you know right. what I mean? Right. So like, I was like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, I'm the friend, but how do I become an asset? Okay, cool. You know what? Photography is what I like to do. Like, how do I add this to your portfolio? How do I add it? So it wasn't, I don't want to say it was like a role at the time. It was like, okay, cool. Like, 
you're my guy, but like, let's figure out how we can like carve out a lane where like you can exist on your own and not be just the guy, you know? So like that, I want to say like, that was like a trial and error. And then when I got to like getting to surge, I understood it a bit more. Right. You know what I mean? So. Right. That's a gem, man. That's a gem. Yeah. Not being a friend and being a guy, but being an asset. That's a yeah, bar. You have to, you have to, bro. You have to. So get into the opportunity with Surge. How did that come about? You know, because I feel like a lot of times, a lot, especially from a when you're doing content and doing photography, it's like everybody's looking for that one big break that can get them into a space or get them into a room. So for you, obviously being able to work with Surge and getting you into that NBA space, like working with the actual player. How did that opportunity come about, man? Like, cause I feel like that's the toughest thing. A lot of people can be good at a craft and things like that, but it's like getting that first opportunity and getting into those rooms is extremely difficult, right? So how were you able to secure that opportunity, you know, working with Surge initially before you really had the huge resume or things like that? Yeah, I think um I attribute a lot of that to mentors. Um, I had a I have a great mentor, his name is Charlie Lindsay. And um, we're really good friends. But at the time, I think I was just getting my foot in the door. He already had the relationship with Serge. I think Serge might have just come from Orlando and was traded to Toronto. This was just before Raptors. Maybe Serge was Raptors for two or three years before we won a chip. Yep. And uh, I got back to Toronto from Greece. And uh, I was sort of just looking to find a place to get my foot in the door with sports, especially basketball, back in the door. And um, he was just like, hey, like, I was asking him things, more technical things about cameras. Okay, what should I get? So on and so forth. What's baseline equipment, yada, yada. And he was just like, okay, like I can't really sit down with you 24 seven, but come to the shoot with me. Right. The shoot was with Surge. Mm. And I was like, oh, this is dope. Um, and because I don't want to say I was desensitized to athletes, but I'd already been around athletes because I was traveling with X. So it wasn't like, a, oh my God, like this is who is it, what, you know what I mean? But I was just like, okay, cool. Like how do you operate and exist in this space? And I think what I will attribute to him was like, he wasn't trying to gatekeep. I feel like a lot of the time when people have opportunities, they try to keep it for themselves. Like, yo, bro, I can't put you onto this because this is my shit right here. You know what I mean? And he was like, yo, bro, like, this is dude. This is dude's manager. Like, y'all exchange infos, keep in contact. And like, we hit it off like the first time we met. And um, me and his manager, uh, his name's Jordy. Uh, I also uh, give some shout out to him because I think a lot of the time people say, yeah, yeah, I'll hit you. I'll hit you. Like, don't worry. And they don't hit you. Yeah, man. He was like, I'm going to message you. I don't know when, but I'm going to hit you. Like, just let me know. And I was like, okay, cool. And maybe like in a week, they hit me for something. I came out. And I think like at that time, you're learning like your rate. Like, what do I charge? Like, is the athlete do I upcharge? Like, am I, do, how do I make a living off this? You know what I mean? And I think like I was still learning and I didn't charge a ton at the time because I was just like, I felt like I wasn't at a place to say like, I'm a master of my skill set. So like I'm learning as I'm trying to help your brand and I might make missteps, but you know what? I'm going to try to correct those missteps so I can prove that I'm valuable in this space for you. You know what I mean? So I like continue to try to do that. And then we just, the relationship developed and developed and then became into like a full-time thing. Almost like he had a cooking show he was doing called How Hungry Are You? And I would like do BTS on that show. And then uh, I went to Congo with him when uh, the Raptors won a championship. We shot a doc for uninterrupted. Um, yeah, it just continued to blossom into bigger and bigger things. And then like, and now like that's someone I can call a friend, you know? That's love. So I'm listening to you speak, man. And I feel like a lot of times I get these questions a lot of times from people when I'm having conversations and it's like, there's always a balance, right? Because you're going into that situation and you're trying to get back into the NBA space. You mentioned, like, you're trying to figure out how I come up for athletes, you know, basketball, all that kind of stuff, right? And they're coming to the shoot, right? You're meeting Serge, you're meeting his manager, and you exchange contact. And it's like, all right, man, I'm putting you in a position where y'all can connect, right? But I think it's also a balance between, all right, you want to be able to connect and let him know, hey, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to work and things like that. But you also don't want to meet somebody for the first time and it's like, oh, what can you do for me? How yeah. can I? you know, work with Serge. Because at the end of the day, when it's somebody like Serge Ibaka or an NBA athlete in general, they're always somebody who's asking them for something or let me do this, let me do that, right? So how did you kind of balance that initially to where you're presenting yourself and letting it be known, like, hey, I do want to work with you. But at the same time, when that off the bat, I don't want to just pull up asking you for favors or asking you to help me out and things like that. Yeah. At the end of the day, I think it's a very fine line, right? You do want to be able to cultivate that relationship 
um, initially, you know, and not come off as like, oh, I just got my hand out, right? So um, how did you navigate that initially? I think like um, a bit of it comes down to culture. I think like, to be completely honest with you right now, I, I'm not like, I don't essentially align with the culture of chasing down athletes, especially not like now. I think now is very like imminent where people are like, I want to work for an NBA player. I want to work for this person. I'm like, bro, what does this person differ from Billy who owns the ice cream store? Right. You know what I mean? Like, bro, Billy who owns the ice cream store could pay you eight G's a month and the athlete only pays you two. Bro, I might work for Billy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> just because Billy can help my the way I live my life. Billy can help pay my bills. You know what I mean? And I think like there's this like infatuation now with like working in sport. And because I'm like, I feel like I try to sift through my DM now, especially on some like, how do I find the people that are really genuine about their craft and not genuine about being a fan? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a separation. Like, if you are a true passionate person about, you know what, my craft, my craft, my craft, my craft. And you're like, you know what? Like, I don't matter. I don't care where it is and who it is. My craft is most important. Those people go so far. The people that are chasing the destination or the person like, oh, I need to be around. I need to work in this because I got to be around this person. What does this person want to do for you just because you're around them? Right. What if they only want to pay you for the work that you do? And that's it. We don't want to be, I don't want to be friends with you, bro. Like, I just, I just want you to do this work for me and go home. You know what right. I mean? And I think like you have to find what's true to your to to your niche, to your passion, like to your heart, to your soul. Like, yo, look, I really want to be, I want to work in sports because I love sports. Okay, cool. How do we help you work in sports? If athlete, if the athlete is just a destination, then when you get there, you're gonna be like, okay, like now what? Right. You know what I mean? And I think like when I got when I said I wanted to work, like I think I was still wanting to just get better at my skill set when Serge came around. You know what I mean? I was like, how do I get better at my skill set? I never imagined, oh, like, Serge, I want to be a part of your team, bro. I want to be with you 24-7. Like, anywhere you go, I want to shoot for you. That was never the goal. You know what I mean? I was just like, this guy's got a lot of motion outside of basketball. He's involved in fashion. He gives back to his community. He goes back to his country. You know what I mean? Like, he had so much more going on other than basketball. And I was like, it can't be be-all, end-all basketball. As much as that shit hurts. You know what I mean? Like, I think, like, we all grow up in impoverished communities, most of us grow up in impoverished communities where basketball is one of the first things given to you. So you that's your true love. So that's all you really want, all you chase, you know? But I think if you find the balance of like, what is my real passion and my skill set? How do I use these tools to level up again and then level up again and then level up again, you know? So now speaking on what you just mentioned about Serge being involved in fashion and going back to Africa and a bunch of different lanes, the cooking show he had, right? Like how do you think being around that helped you develop your personal skills or just introduce you to another industry and things like that outside of sports? Because I feel like being able to shoot basketball and go to a game and capture moving athletes is way different than capturing a still person, uh, a still body, if it's a, a fashion shoot or whatever the case may be. So you get to sharpen your tools in a bunch of different industries. You get to shake hands with a bunch of different people in a bunch of different places. Um, just talk about, I guess, kind of what having those experiences early on in your career, you know, did for you. Um, and kind of how that contributed to what you're doing now. Yeah, I think it allows you to put on wear different hats. You know what I mean? In the sports space, you might be able to come a bit more like casual and shit like that. Now you might go to a fashion space. You got to know how to put it together. You know what I mean? Like you got to be like, all right, cool. I can't just come super casual because now I represent this person. So anything, the way I speak, I got to speak so eloquently. I can't just like riz and just like let the comments flow type shit. You know what I mean? Like I got to be able to like keep the shit together. So I think, like, because he wore so many hats, it was like watching someone put on a different mask every time they went out. It would be like, okay, cool, he's going around these business individuals. Okay, he's got to put on this, like, suit and tie, like, super professional prestige surge. Okay, when he was doing a cooking, cooking show, you can see the personality flow a bit more because he was chilling. It was his space, what he loved to do. Okay, now when he's in, in a basketball space, okay, it's it's serious, but with a taste of flavor because he's into the fashion space. You know what I mean? So, like, a lot of those things... You get to watch him put on different hats. And like by watching him put on different hats, it sort of makes you feel like in life, you got to be a chameleon. You got to be able to move through different rooms very easily. And you right. can't be so stuck in your ways to be like, oh, this is who I am. People got to accept me at this and da 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 da. I'm like, that is true. But I'm like, a lot of doors going to stay closed for you if you don't know how to move in certain spaces. You know what I mean? So watching him move through all those spaces, I was just like, yo, I have to either adapt 
or I'm going to get left behind. You know what I mean? So I think like that professionalism, I learned really quickly. Time management, I learned quickly. Um, I think understanding that athletes and fashion enthusiasts are completely different. As much as we operate in the same space now, because sport and fashion is integrated a lot, like fashion is a completely different world. It's very much more respected in Europe than it might be in America. You know what I mean? Like, so like you have to treat those relationships very differently and respect those differently. You know what I mean? So it just, it just taught me a lot. I just, again, how to move and how to be a chameleon. And that's something I just take throughout life now too. Sure. For sure. So you work with Serge and then obviously you get an opportunity to work with the Raptors. How did that opportunity come about? And I guess, what was that, I guess, moment like for you, you know, when you first were able to work for the Raptors, being a kid from Toronto, um, yeah. and being able to get the opportunity to work for the hometown team. Um, it was fun, you know. I think like I um surged myself with friends for a period of time and uh obviously played for the team. And like funny enough, like the team at the time, like sports at the time were not really welcoming to players, content people. Like this is a whole new thing, you know what I mean? I think like now we're so accustomed to it, everyone's got a photo guy and yada yada. But when I was coming in, like it wasn't a thing. Player teams were like, we have a content team. What do you need a guy around 24-7 for? You know what I mean? We don't need this. And I think, like, Serge, again, being such a multifaceted person, he's like, it's not just about the basketball. This guy just needs to be around because I do so much, yeah. you know? So I got to build a relationship and a rapport with um, the people on the front office staff and PR. As much as the people that worked in corporate that were, like, come to the games and so on and so forth, I got to see them um, for the games that I did get to go to. Now, mind you, like, they were really restricting on how much access they gave people who were not part of team content. It would be like, yo, you can only go this far. Like we can go further. Like you can stay right here. You know what I mean? Like, so they're really restricting, but um, the relationship sort of developed and blossomed. And then I think just before uh, maybe two, three years before COVID hit, um, they had a role open and it wasn't even for the Raptors role. It was for their G League affiliate role. And I was like, yo, I don't know if this is my entrance to get to where I want to get to, but let me apply for the G League affiliate role. So I applied for the G League affiliate role. And then when I got the interview and I got to the final stage, I think you just have to find a point in time where you're true to yourself. And I think a lot of people will say, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, but they're not. But I literally had told them, like, look, I'm very overqualified for this role. I'm not coming to you asking you to give me the role above because that wasn't the role that was posted. But I'm telling you, the role you guys are offering, I'm overqualified for this. Like, what you're asking me to do, like, I've already done it three times over. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm going to take it, but just know this is not what I'm, I want. And that could fucking lose you the job. Like, they could be like, all right, cool, bro. We're just going to go into the next candidate. You know what right. I mean? For someone that wants to really build in this role for a period of time to eventually go there. Right. But it just so happened, like, bro, God works. Like, literally, they're like, okay, cool. Tris will call you back in, like, 48 hours. Bro, they call me back in, like, 20 minutes they're like yo you know what we actually have the role above vacant we weren't going to post it for a month but do you want to re-interview for that role i was like shit all right bet. like shit. let's double down you know so i doubled down and i reapplied for or i re-interviewed for that role and i got the role and then like the rest is history bro so i gotta rewind a little bit man like i feel like it takes it takes a lot of confidence man to be able to walk into an interview even even those the G League team, you knew you were overqualified for, but to be able to verbalize that and say, "Listen, yeah. I'm overqualified for this," so I'm gonna yeah. let y'all know, right? Yeah. What allowed you to be able to have the confidence to say that, right? And I guess you're obviously the work shows, so I think yeah. that's part of it. But um, a lot of times people are going to interviews and like, "All right, man, I don't want to like step on any shoes or come up." So, right, like, what allowed you to go into that room and be able to say that, and then? Obviously, it paid off because they opened up a whole role that wasn't supposed to be opened up for you. So, yeah, yeah. clearly, it was the right move to make. But I think a lot of people who hear that would be like, yo, hold on. like Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man. I think, like, you have to be honest with yourself. I think a lot of the time, people are – you gas yourself up to believe you are ready, but you know, you know, I haven't put in the work yet. And I even try to tell, like, people that I mentors to now, I'm like, don't skip steps. Like when you're ready, you will know, you look at your body of work, you look at the people you shake, shook hands with and you know, okay, do I know the technical? Do I know how to move and operate in a corporate space? Have I understood that already? Okay, you know what? Like 
have I exceeded their expectations and the asks? You know what I mean? Like, okay, what do I bring to the table? Am I an asset? Am I a liability for them? And when I looked at all those things, and, I, and then I looked at also like, I'm like a, I'm not just a fan, but I'm like an advocate of the sport where I'm looking at like, okay, what are the makeups of other social teams? And I'm already on social, LinkedIn, all that other stuff, like really tapped into the way that people are creating for these teams. I'm like, okay, like, how do I measure up? It keeps yourself honest. Okay, like, am I doing this? Okay, am I not doing enough of this? You know what I mean? And I looked at it and I was just like, I was happy as shit for the call. Don't get me wrong. Because I was like, they t I applied and they were like, yo, you got the job. But when I got to the end of the call, I was just like, yo, I'm, I felt like I was doing myself a disservice. Right. I was right. like, yo, I, I'm, like, I'm, I'm like, I did so much. I'm like, bro, I live here. I moved here. I worked with this person. I already worked with a player on the actual team. I'm like, bro, I'm overqualified for this. Right. They're just like, fuck, shit, bro, you're right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Now that's, that's, I think I think I think that's that's awesome, man, to be able to like, have that type of confidence. I think too, man, a lot of people can hear that and like understand that like just as much as people are interviewing you for a job, like you're interviewing them as well because you have to step into that role and be able to perform. And yeah. at the end of the day, you have the power to decline a job just as much as the team has the opportunity to extend you a job offer. Right. So just because you interview and they offer you the job doesn't mean you have to take it. So I think that that's an important thing to note as well in the situation that you weren't just going to say, hey, all right, cool, I'll take it, knowing that there was more on the horizon for yourself. And I yeah. think that if you're listening to this, um, you know, that's an amazing thing to just keep in mind, man, that you don't have to say yes to every opportunity. You can always ask for more, even if it's an offer, more money, et cetera. Right. Um, so once you get into the role with the Raptors, man, talk about just kind of like what your day-to-day -day was like. I know – uh, we've had a couple of people here that have kind of been in that role. I know it's it's super demanding, you know, being in that in that corporate space, man. So talk about kind of what that responsibility was like for you stepping into that role. Yeah, like um, a bit of the role, I will say, like based off of the the scene of sports depends on the the market you're in, right? I think some, and this comes down to the way some teams build their in their their so their social teams. Some teams believe social doesn't or social doesn't drive business, so they don't give it enough headcount. When I mean enough headcount, like there's not enough bodies working on a social team. Right. Some people believe the brand team is the driver for to make the team money, so they give more headcount to that and less headcount. You know what I mean? So like it depends on what market, what city you're in. They'll sort of choose like, okay, you know what? Like we need this person to facilitate not just his role, but three other roles because you know we don't think that we should develop enough headcount for this role. So when I was at, on the Raptor social team, like. We didn't have a large headcount. And I think, again, social was also coming to a space where are we sure that this is a, should be the driver of the business? You know what I mean? Are we sure this is where we should put all of our chips to say, hey, you know what, reach our fan base and so on and so forth. And I think um, just being in that space, it was it was difficult because, like, there's, it's not a nine to five. Like, it's not real work hours. Like, um, you might get to the game of the fan at seven. And I got to the game of the fan as a working employee at three. You know what I mean? And depending on if my earliest players was always Fred, you get there at 2.30 to go shoot, which means I got to be there by the time he's coming to shoot. You know what I mean? Because that's a part of your your game day coverage. You know what I mean? So there was stuff like that from game day coverage to travel. Like I was a full-time traveler. I know some teams, and I've heard other people on a podcast say they had they split, they split it up with other people. Um, I wasn't splitting it up. It was just me. So I did all 41 on the road, all 41 at home, all-star, summer league, draft, training camp. Like, yeah. it felt like I was fucking a player. You know what I mean? Like, the shit was a lot. But, I mean, like, it was fun. Don't get me wrong. And I think, like, you take the good with the bad. And I don't want to say it was bad because it was definitely a learning experience. But there was just a lot of time you have to dedicate. Now, if you hear from anyone in social, they'll say, ah, oh, like, you know, but there's the perks and so on and so forth. And I think that's sort of sometimes you'll find a trade off. You know, you um get to go to cities you might not have to go too often, and you get to see friends you don't get to see often because you get to travel and so on and so forth. You stay at nice hotels, you eat great food. You know what I mean? But I think you have to separate that from is that who you actually are? Are you affording that lifestyle, or is a job afford you that lifestyle? You know what I mean? And then you fall into imposter syndrome because it's like you might think like this is who I am. No, no, no. The team allows you to live like this. You know what I mean? Like, and I think that's a, that's a big thing where people don't like to leave the role because they've now identified themselves with this person in the role and that's not who they are. The team just allows you to do that. And that's where you find people staying in jobs for 10, 12, 15 years. Nothing wrong with that. You can have a great job for 15 years. Yeah. But at social, I know that the cap on how much money you make. 
Right. So they're not paying you what you can live off of there for 10, 12, 15 years. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of the time it's like when you see people get stuck in those roles and I'm like a big advocate of telling people like, you'll try to level up. And if the camera is like what you like to do, try to find a way to level up out the camera. So maybe you're now you're, you're a director, you know what I mean? So you can make a bit more coin, but you're not actually holding, you're doing a technical, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, my day-to-day -day was a lot. I think like I had great partners and great friends that I got to work with, but um, at the space I was there, it was like very um, understaffed, which a lot of teams will say they're very understaffed, but it was very understaffed, but there was a benefit. I felt like I found my tribe there was like a brotherhood, um, me being in close age with the players on the team. Um, you get to find friends and you get to find people to just chop it up with. Um, and then being of our culture, being of black culture, it's like a lot of the players are predominantly black. So it's like you're finding the same issues, same problems. Obviously, you're in a complete different class and they make millions of dollars. But, you know, um, we're, we're going through the same world life struggles. You know what I mean? And I think like you find that to adapt and then. Front office, I would say, used me as an asset because it was like a lot of the people in those roles might not look like me. But because I am who I am, we could use Tristan as a bridge to get through and speak to athletes because they talk the same language or they listen to the same music or like they laugh at the same dumb jokes. You know what I mean? And it was just like, OK, cool. We can really use him outside of his creative skill because they they found like this friend, this friendship, this bond, you know what I mean? So no, nah, man, it was cool. So I want to know what is it like traveling for 41 games? You like you're you're you you doing all 82. So it's like hell, you're pretty much a player, man. So like hell, bro. <laughs> NBA travel really like for the people who may because I think a lot of times people will see NBA guys and they'll maybe they'll have a bad game and it's like, man, what's going on? Like it's like, bro, you don't understand how tough I did, bro. It's going from hotel to hotel flying, getting in at 4 a.m. and going to the hotel, having a back-to-back -back and all that kind of stuff, man. So talk about what that was like, you know, having to go through that NBA schedule on the road. It's it's a lot, you know what? And I will give a little shout-out to actually someone who works for Houston right now. Her name is Hannah Perry, but she has she's really big following on social and TikTok, and she's doing a great job for empowering women in sport. But what I also like that she does is she's giving pulling the curtain on, like, how – her day-to-day -day travel is or like what she's got to do when she gets to the hotel, which like I find a lot of social content creators now are trying to like, okay, now you've seen the work, look what it happens for me to get to do this work. You know what I mean? So the travel is definitely crazy. Like if you're an East coast team, you have two long West coast road trips a year. If you're a West coast team, you have two long East road trips a year. You know what I mean? And both of those trips say those trips are six or seven games, six or seven games, not six or seven days. Six or seven games to games. That might be a 14 game road trip. I've gone as long as a 16 game or 16 day road trip. You know what I mean? You're gone, you're paying rent on a place you're not even living in back home because you're gone so long. You know what I mean? Not to mention if you have kids, pets, all that, which is why like it's sort of hard to be in these roles if you have those things. You know what I mean? And I think like from getting to go to a plane after a game you might have played in at home, I think we had a, a stretch like we played at home, the game finished at 10 30. You got to wait for guys to shower. If you were working content like me, as soon as I'm done cutting up for the game, I'm getting in my car and I'm driving to the terminal. And I'll wait and I'll get on the plane. Now guys have made their way from the gym to the plane. We fly to a city that's three hours away. Our time difference back. You land, take a 30-minute bus ride to the hotel, wake up, go to shoot around at 10 a.m., go back to the hotel and nap, go back to the game to for like pregame, play the game, get back on a plane, go somewhere else. Like, bro, it's sometimes it's crazy. Like, it doesn't even seem real. And I think, like, as a fan, when I was a – I'm still a fan, but, like, as a fan, when you just get to consume the game and you turn off TV and you go to bed, and yeah. then you turn off tomorrow and they're just back up somewhere else, you know what I mean? Like, you don't think about it. Like, I think, like, I try to give as much respect to the people that work behind the scenes because as much as you get to watch the players, you pay the players, like, our equipment guys do crazy work. Like, I'm talking, like, okay, cool. We've now cleaned up the back bench. Put sneakers back in the bags, bought the bags on the truck, truck to the plane. Our equipment guys unload the plane, everyone's suitcases, not just team equipment. They unload the plane, put it back on the truck, truck to the hotel. They unload the truck, tag all the bags that, so that go to the players' rooms, send them upstairs, and then they can go to sleep after everyone's already in their room. So it's like, yeah. shit is crazy, bro. It's like a crazy machine. I don't even know how it works, bro. It's a grind. <laughs> so I want to, I want to, I want to, 
let you reminisce a little bit, man. I want because you know, again, there are, are some nice perks about being on the road, man. So I want to know if you can recall your favorite, you know, night out, maybe after a game y'all on the road, you know what I'm saying? Tell me about you know one of the I know, like I said, when you guys are on the road, man, dudes is, is playing and it's a grind, man. But you also get to have a little bit of fun on the road too, man. Oh, yeah, so, no, definitely. What, definitely. What, what would you say is your most memorable road trip? You know, can you um for us for the East Coast teams, I will say it's West Coast road trips. Yeah. Now being on the West Coast, I can't wait for my trip to go back to Toronto because that right. is gonna be flipping biblical, you know what I mean? But I think being on the East Coast, you're like you get like a LA, LA, play Lakers, Clippers. So you're in LA for like four or five days. You might play on LA on Friday, Lakers on Friday. You get Saturday off. Sunday off, maybe then play the Clippers on Monday. So you're there for a good bit of time. And then you stay like in Beverly Hills. So it's like, you're like, yo, could I afford to stay in Beverly right now on my own dime for five days, six days? Probably not. You know what I mean? Right. Where the room rates are like 1200 a night. Like, you know what I mean? So like, Nah, man, I enjoy I enjoy my West Coast road trips because like we'll get like L.A. L.A. We'll get like San Fran. We'll get like Phoenix. So it's like you're going from again, like I'm going from Toronto where it's like you get all four seasons. And then usually when we travel to the West Coast, like it's just hot climate. So it's like now I'm just packing shorts to go on these road trips and like the polo tees and like, you know, slides and Crocs and shit. So nah, man, my West Coast trips are definitely the best. And I have a lot of friends that live in like California. So like it's literally like a big link up. I'd be like, yo, guys, look at the schedule. I'll be there. Like, as soon as I land, tomorrow's an off day. Like, where are we going? Like, we're going to the mall. <laughs> we're going to go eat. Like, you know what I mean? So I'd be trying to enjoy that shit for the most part, bro. So is there any stories that you can share on the podcast of a, of a night out that, you, that was particularly memorable? Particularly memorable? Um, you know what? I went out uh, my first season. I might get crucified for this. I went out my first season. Um, and we didn't really uh i think at the time i took my job for granted where i was like i blurred the lines from employee to friend mm -hmm. and i think there's a large thing that's happening in sports right now because you try to create that divide where there's professionalism like you're here to do a job yes it's fun yes so you get to enjoy shit but like you're here to really facilitate this role you know what i mean and my first season, because I was friends with guys already, the mindset of being a employee was never really there. I'm like, I'm like, I'm just good with the camera shit, but these are the homies, you right. know? Right. So I think like we went to Miami. All shit always happens in Miami, bro. So we went to Miami and it was like, I think I went out with like a couple of the guys and we went to like, we landed home. We landed at one in the morning. We got to the hotel at like two, one thirty ish, one forty-five. Came back downstairs, went to like eleven, I think it's called out there. Then went to this next club. We didn't get back home to like well, I didn't get back to my hotel until like five in the morning, six in the morning. And we had shoot around at ten. And like I got cooked for it after we came back from the trip. Because when you go out, like, usually, like, your team security will go out with you. Okay. So, like, team security was playing his role, but he wasn't really trying to say anything because he was like, yo, like, clearly they they vouch for Tris. But, like, I, he has something to report to outside of – he doesn't just report, he doesn't report to the players. He has a boss. Right. So, he has to be like, oh, we went out and Tris was out with us. Like, you know what I mean? So, like, I tried to duck going out when – Team security was going out the rest of the season type shit. You know what I mean? You find your you find your one off homie and you go out with them or your player one off, you go out with them and shit. But yeah, no, Miami was a blur and we played them. It was like we played like a home and home. Not even home and home, like a because we're last season, I think not last season, two seasons ago, uh what they did with Toronto, they did like a lot of like um so we didn't have to cross the border a lot. We played the same same team twice in their city. Uh, okay. So we play Miami on Monday and then play Miami again on Wednesday in mm -hmm. the same city. So it'd be like, bro, you're Miami for four days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, bro, it's like a blur, you know what I mean? Like, plus Trey's out there, you know what I mean? Like, where me and Trey are going crazy. So it's like, yeah, man, like, it, shit, was, shit was a blur, bro. And, like, that was definitely fun. But I had to reel this shit back in after that road trip. Like, I'll say I still went out, like, certain places, but it was trying to be, like, solo motion or one or two other times. But, 
that was one one trip I was looking at the blur because like you just you do you forget it's like you have a friend and you're kicking with them you guys chat it up now you feel like yo you guys are homies yo bro you're going to the club bro I'm coming to the club with you all right, right. let's go and you forget like you still are an employee of the team right you're not just friends you know what I mean like so definitely hard to create that divide. I will say this though, man. I want to talk to you about this because I feel like this is somebody I, I talked uh one of my homies about this off, you know, off A we were in DC just getting getting brunch and stuff. We're talking, and they're like, yeah, man, a lot of these teams, they like forbid the players and the photographers from being friends. Like you can't be you can't have a relationship with the players. I'm just in my mind, I'm thinking, bro, I'm like, yo, for example, like yourself, I'm on the road with these guys 41 games. We on PJs, we on them playing together, playing cards, we're in the hotel. It's impossible for us not to develop a relationship. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, I don't understand why they say that. I mean, I understand that the thought because, all right, well, yeah, they become friends and they're going to leave or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But I thought that's not realistic. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like for you, I just want to give you opportunity to speak to that a little bit because I think that, yeah, that might be a policy, but I don't, I don't know how you can realistically put a camera in somebody's face, be on the road and not develop any type of relationship with them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know what it is? I think like, I don't want to say it's exclusive to like content creators because I think we have this problem throughout the league with everybody. We're talking like medical staff. We're talking like nutritionists. We're talking like coaching staff, right? Like certain coaches run their ship where it's like, bro, this is a business. Yeah, You need to be here to hoop. And you need to be here to service the people that hoop. Right. And if you stay in your two friggin' lanes, we'll have no problems. Right. But I think, again, it's like, how do you tell someone you're not supposed to find your tribe? Bro, we're together. 41 games. That's not 41 days. 41 games for us on the road is like 100 some odd days on the road. Right. Bro, you're with someone 100 days, bro. They're practically family at this point. You know what I mean? Like, you see them every, you see them every day. You see them at practice. You see them on a plane. You see them in a hotel lobby. You see them at breakfast. You see them at lunch. You see them on the road. You guys walk. Like, you see them everywhere. You know what I mean? And like it's hard to create that divide, and I don't think the they're they're more so like oh we don't want them to be friends because we don't want them to leave, but everyone that works in sports is a male, so you also don't want like a situation to happen whether it be male female staff, and now you're like oh conflict of interest, and what are you gonna do penalize the player? No, you're automatically gonna penalize the staff. You're gonna be like bro, you knew better. You shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have been with so and so keep it professional so we don't have this shit happening. You know what I mean? Because I think like, even with the content creators, right? And I'm going to speak to the content creators, this is what I know, but it's like, bro, we're with you guys 24 seven, half, 90% of the team, you have your phone numbers. Like I will say the NBA has made it, you use like Greenfly, which will be like an app for us to put the photos in, players to take their shit out. But a lot of these players are not technical savvy. So they're just sending me the text, like, Tris, send me the, send me the shit, bro. Like, right. so I have 90% of the players on my team phone numbers you know what i mean i'm talking to them every day and it's like now when you can talk about photos okay oh bro where are you going tonight oh bro where are you going now we're talking about other shit you know what i mean so you it's hard to create that separation but i think teams try to do it just so it's like you have no hiccups throughout the season you don't have like a guy buying something for a, a, a staff member on the team and it could be looked at as like this staff member took advantage of the player and had them spend their money on me or whatever the case may be because i know like we've had times where we've gone out to team dinners and a player be like, I got the bill. And it'd be looked at as like, bro, you're not, we're not supposed to be here to use your ability to spend and overspend. Like, no, we have a corporate team card for this, so on and so forth. But again, the players just being nice and who they are and being of a place of privilege, they're like, oh no, we got it. Like, it's cool, you know? But I think they try to create that separation so you don't have that. It's like, bro, be in your role and stay in your role. That's it. That's a good point. That's a good point. So I appreciate the insight on that. I didn't really understand it, but when you put it like that, it does make it does make sense. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And then they just liability on their end too to kind of protect them themselves as a big corporation as well. So I do understand that. So sure. um, I want to ask you though, man, because I know you were working with Serge at this time, but talk to me about you know the Raptors winning that championship, man. And and, and so legendary. like legendary. <laughs> I feel like that is, you know, from the outside looking in. I'm watching the parade. I'm watching just the fanfare in the arena. It looked insane. Like, oh, Drake, ever. like he was playing, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was, the, you know? that was the, biggest, the biggest ever, man. I think, like, being from Canada, one, being from Toronto, the whole, like, nostalgia of the Raptors. We're talking, like, Vince Carter, Tracy McGrady. We're talking Butch Carter days. We're talking, like, the... 
what it meant to the city and the country. Because remember, we had the Grizzlies at one point in time, the Vancouver Grizzlies. So we had two teams, but now Toronto has become Canada's team because there's only one team there. I know the NBA is talking about expanding, but eventually we'll get back there. But I'm like, for it to be Toronto, for Toronto to be Canada's team, like, bro, it was biblical. I think, and this is not even a biased thing, like, it was the biggest parade in NBA history. Bro, we had like 4 million people outside. The parade was supposed to start at 10 and finish at 2. And it went till seven. It was like they, the, the buses couldn't get down the road. There were so many people like standing in the streets and they had to have police. Like, bro, it was the biggest parade I've ever seen in my entire life. And it was like cell phones weren't working. Like, bro, it was it was crazy. It was madness. And like to live through that with Surge, it was like. <laughs> like a whole other experience because he's like never won a chip before. Yeah. And a lot of the guys there have never won a chip. So it's like. I think when you're on a team with a bit of pedigree that might have won a championship, whether in your lifetime or not, teams are like, oh, like, yeah, we won, like, back in the 80s. We won back in the 90s. Like, this team has never won anything. <laughs> so we're looking at it like, but we don't even know what it feels like. Yeah. On top of it, like, people think that hockey, uh, Canada is a hockey country. Right. So now when you get Canada, and this is where you get this, this boom of athletes. Now, people can look back at a point in time and be like, oh, I remember when the Raptors won. And that inspired me to go play basketball this is going to create another generational wave of, of players you know what i mean so it's like to even see that it's like bro i think when Kawhi got there there was just like oh like we could be for real you know yeah. and it wasn't until like and to be honest i won't even say i was a fucking firm believer when Kawhi got there and like that's because in toronto and canada we don't we're not broadcasting spurs games you know what i mean so i couldn't see like this guy was prolific Right, <laughs> you know, what I mean, you're not, you don't get to watch them on a day to day basis, you know, and like you know the way like ESPN and ABC pump shit. Anyways, you're gonna see a whole bunch of Braun clips, KD clips, like whoever looks flashy, that's what you're about to see on the highlight reels. Anyways, so you're not really seeing Kawhi, bro. When he got there, I was like, bro, who's gonna stop this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, who's this? He was dunking on everybody, forcing thirties, game winner over Philly. The game winner over Philly was crazy, bro. The building was shaking, like. <laughs> <laughs> like the floor was shaking and i'm just like bro this is absolutely crazy to see man and i'm just like for to be from there and then see that happen like i'm cool now to die happy raptors on the chip <laughs> like you know what i mean like that shit is legendary bro for sure for sure and then like again surge surge um he took that and he went to congo with, with the with the with the trophy which was flipping crazy bro yeah it was, what was that experience like out there man in congo bro mm -hmm. Wild because I don't think I'd ever make it to Africa in my life. Yeah, and it was like the NBA allows players to take the trophy to like their hometown, home city, yada yada. So the idea honestly came up random. Like Jordy sent me a text, just like he always does. Yo, Tris, what are you doing next week? And I was like, I don't know, bro. <laughs> and he was like, Okay, cool. We got to get you to go because when you go to Africa, you got to get like like a yellow fever shot. You gotta get a visa, you gotta get malaria pills, or certain things you gotta do before you go to Africa. Yeah. I was like, oh, like I don't know. He's like, okay, we gotta get you go get the shot. Da, 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 da. I'm like, for what? He's like, oh, like uninterrupted trying to do this thing. Um, we're gonna bring the trophy to Congo. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, it's a full production, da, 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 da. And we didn't even talk about rates because at this time I'm just like, bro, to think, and I think it was like a moment where you sit down, you think about all the things you've done to get up until this point. And you just go crazy. This is wild. Like where basketball is taking me. I'm like, bro, I'm going to Africa for like two weeks. And it was like, we went to all the places that like he grew up in. We met the president of Congo. We went to his house with a trophy. We gave him a jersey. Bro, like we went like to the place of surgeons to have food. We went to go see his grandma up in the hills with a trophy. Bro, it was like, and again, like being from the USA, I think. When you bring your with one people that win, when they bring that trophy to their city, it's your city that's celebrating with you. You know what I mean? And it might be close friends, close homies. Sometimes it's like 100, 200 people turn out. Bro, we went to Africa. It was like, it was like Michael Jordan touched the ground, bro. Like Serge had murals on the wall, like people chasing up through the streets. Bro, the shit was madness. We had to go everywhere with security. It was wild, bro. Wildest shit in the time of my life. And I know that the the film you guys put together with Uninterrupted, that got nominated for an award. Like, talk about yeah. that process, like, working alongside Uninterrupted to kind of put that whole thing together. Because you mentioned earlier in the podcast, you know, right, it's more than just shooting a camera, right? If you can have more to do with directing. And I was like, you're seeing this 
production be put together, you know, with uninterrupted yeah. things like that. So what, what was that whole process like being able to, I guess, see that come together, be a part of that, getting it put together? Like, what was that like? Um, it was cool, man. I think like that sparked a lot of interest to get into the directing space and like to be, um, even just to get into the editing space to watch how that stuff gets put together. I think like you go there and you go there with a team. Like I went there on behalf of Surge. I didn't even go on behalf of Uninterrupted, but Uninterrupted obviously sent the sound guy. They send two camera guys. They send like an editor, a drone spe- flight pilot. You know what I mean? And it's like, now it's you, Surge, Surge's manager, security and then six shooters and you just fucking walk around the streets of congo you know what i mean so it was like crazy to see that this collection of people could put together a body of work that's nominated yeah. you know what i mean and then like you watch it happen in real time i think like i don't even think i was thinking about a doc at the at, while, while it was going on i was just like it's so crazy to live in this moment to see all this going on seeing his people happy like him going to see old coaches old family members like give back to his community and like while you're doing all that, you're like, yo, we're actually producing a film while this is going on. Like, and it doesn't, it's not even scripted because it's like a too good to be true story. You're just watching people's reactions and getting that and using that to create a film. You know what I mean? So even getting nominated for a film for an award, um, I was like, that's insane. Like, that's nothing I've ever thought about. You know what I mean? I've never been like, oh, I want to get nominated for a screen award or yada yada, or anything I've done will be nominated for a screen award. And when you look at that, you're just like, yo, bro, this is crazy to see, like, and I'm I'm not even thinking about the camera. I'm like, so crazy to see where basketball could take you. You know what I mean? I'm like, basketball take you flipping all over the flipping globe. Yeah. Twice. You know what I mean? So. That's yeah, bro. So I kind of want to get into your time, like, you know, kind of more present day, right? And obviously you recently decided to lead the Raptors to kind of pursue you know, this role with, with Fred. I want to talk about, like, what was that process like leaving the Raptors um, what went into that decision um, and kind of just talk us through what that time period was like trying to figure out what your next move was going to be. Um, so a bit of it was like you hit a ceiling. I think for some people, your ceiling comes a lot quicker based off of what you've already done before you got to this point of working for a team. I felt like I had done so much before I got to the team. And then when I got to the team, I felt like most creatives might think this too, but there's a, there's a, there's a creative ceiling. There's only so much you can do when you work for a team. People feel like, well, why don't teams do this? this? No, bro, it doesn't work like that. Like, creatively, you have to operate within a box when you work for an NBA team or any sport team. Right. Some teams allow a bit more leash. We're like, let, let me let our, let our creatives go wild. You know what I mean? But for the most part, you got to operate with the mindset of how do we create to generate dollars? Like, I don't care if you can make this dice walk and talk and all these things. doesn't matter is this going to make me money or not right. i think like when i was with the team i was like i felt like i invested enough into the relationships i had i had late relationships with like everyone from Masai to our gm bobby to front office to med staff players on the corporate side i felt like i had done enough i felt like um i was hitting a bit of a wall with like wanting more money because i think the, the running trend is people say you're underpaid in sport especially on content side you know what i mean and like underpaid i'll say is a is a personal thing because i think everyone everyone's number is not the same right but i do believe based off your circumstances you could be like yo look i put in this 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 i do this 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 these are my dependents here i have a dog or whatever the case may be like I need to make a bit more. And it depends on the market you live in. Like I live in Toronto, one of the most fucking expensive places to live on a planet. So I'm like, you can't be paying me peanuts to fucking do this job and expect that I'm supposed to be happy to just get on fucking private planes and live the life. You know what I mean? What am I I'm not doing that? You know what I mean? And I think like some people are willing to do that to an extent because again, we talk about like imposter syndrome. You just don't know when to leave because you think that's your lifestyle and so on and so forth. But when you start to think about kids and families and all that stuff, you're like, yo, how do I, your age, how, okay. What point in time do I say, you know, I need to fucking get real and get some like real coins and shit like that. So I think like being in that, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm not sure if I'm at a point to leave, but I need to make some shit shake. And uh, while thinking about trying to make some shit shake, um, the season had just come to an end. We just, I think we just lost a play into Miami. And um, me having this relationship with Fred, which like rolled into that, but me having this relationship with Fred, like 
me and Fred talked throughout the season where he'd be like, okay, like, what do you do? Okay, cool. Like, like how much of it, what you do? And Fred's like a forward mind person. He's trying to like build super conglomerates. So he's like, okay, like, fuck, like, okay, maybe it might cost me one, to get one of Tristan. It might cost me this. And like, okay, to build like a Spring Hill Uninterrupted Empire, which might be costing this and yada, yada. So he's already forward thinking while he's asking me the questions. I'm just answering the questions because it's my homie. Right. And I think like in us having those like conversations throughout the season, when he became a free agent, um, he was just like, we were, I think we were in Chicago or Rockford where he's from and he had a little charity foundation. And he was just like, um, Yo, what, what would the, what would it be for you to leave? Like the team, I was like, I'm like, yo, bro, I want to leave, but like, what does that, what does that look like, you know? And um, I think I came back from Toronto like the next two days. And this is like June, so the, the playoffs maybe are just about to finish. And um, about to go to summer league in July. And he's like, yo, how would you come work for me? So I'm like, all right, like, what does this look like? And obviously, we spoke about it. Um. But once it became an idea, I was just like, bro, like, I know what it was like with being on the freelance side already. So obviously I had to like negotiate to a point where I'm like, it's got to make sense for me to leave. Right. But I'm like, what better than working with a friend that, you know, is going to have your best interest at heart. They're going to respect your work. You can dedicate all the creative juices to one person. You can dedicate all the creative juices to branding and trying to help, help that person explore and exploit their brand. I was like, yeah, this is like the best decision. So literally I might've quit like a week after having that conversation with Fred, handed my two weeks in and I went to summer league with the Raptors. So I finished my like tenure with the Raptors after summer league and then it was done. Yeah. So I want to know like, and you don't have to get into necessarily your, your pockets personally, but I do yeah. want to know what that conversation is like trying to, cause you talk about rates and advocating for yourself and being able to live on your own. Like, what is that process like talking to Fred? Like, all right, Fred, like this is what I'm making with the team, you know, but I need to make a little more, right? I need to be able to, this is what I bring to the table. This is what I've done in the past. What is that process like, man? Because also Fred's like, all right, well, you know, you're talking about how he's a forward thinker. He has things that he's trying to build, right? And we talked about this with, with Nav um, a while back who works with, for people who listen, they might not have, have um, not be familiar. Nav, uh, he works with Trey Young. He's Trey Young's creative content guy. So yeah, I haven't watched that episode Go ahead and go back and watch that. He dropped a bunch of gems on there as well. Um, but he mentioned, like, all right, well, his conversation was kind of, all right, with Trey, like, you know, however much you invest into me, I can then pour in back into you and, you know, yeah. make yourself look X, Y, Z, right? So what is that process like when you're talking to Fred, trying to discuss what this is going to look like from a financial perspective? And like, all right, Fred, this is what I need as Tristan. This is what I bring to the table. Um, and trying to figure all that out. Um, I think... The misconception a lot of the time people think like because players are put under the magnifying glass we automatically know what they make down to the fucking penny right contracts are public they sign you go oh this person got the big bag he can afford me you know what right. i mean and it's not always like that because i'm like what what was to say if fred had like was only living off his endorsements and wasn't living off his contract what if he was what if he had his contract locked up in investments you know what i mean and he had no real money like that and he was you know what i mean so I think like the conversation of what is it that you want to achieve as Fred Van Vliet has to come down to the bottom, bottom line. Okay. Like, what is it? Okay, bro. You want to have a foundation website development. You want to push the culture forward in your community. You want to be more brandable. You want to get equity in certain companies. Okay, cool. Like, well, Fred, this is my skill set. I can help you with this, 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 this. I might not be able to do this, but I have the people who have the answers to this, 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 Okay, like, you're in a space where the sports world is, everything on the court is you. And I'm like, everything in media and branding and content and marketing is me. So let's now gauge this. Okay, cool. We know that teams probably pay 30% under market value for what a social content coordinator is or a manager. Because if you look at some agencies, some social content coordinators and managers make 100 g's right but in sports i don't fucking not none of them are making 100 g's right you know what i mean so it's like okay cool now he might look at that and go okay we'll flip tris okay like are you telling me it's 100 g's with the work 
I'm like, oh, fuck, bro. Yeah, it might be 100 Gs with work. You know what I mean? Because of the amount of stuff you got to do. Okay, well, if you want me to travel, if you want me to go here, if you want me to go there. Okay, well, like, if you want me to like outsource to make your website, if you want me to like sit on the phone, do emails and so on and so forth, my life is going to be consumed with you at this point. You know what I mean? And a lot of the time, sometimes players find people that live in their city. I'm like, I don't even live in your country. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's another investment. Okay, bro, I got to get a visa. I got to be able to live here, like legally pay taxes. Like, okay, what does that look like? You know what I mean? And like, now when you have that conversation, you can sort of like sculpt out a ballpark number. You're like, all right, cool. Like, bro, what's going to be this? And like, you have to pitch players on, I don't even just say players. You have to pitch whoever that person is on a long-term plan. Because whatever whatever you're doing for them is not going to be like, bro, I'm going to get this shit done for you in a year. And bro, we solid. Like, thanks for this cool 80, 90, 100, whatever fucking getting paid. No, bro, I'm investing. If I'm going to pay you this year by year by year, you got to now come to me with goals. This is still a business. Like, Tris, in year one, what do you hope to achieve for this? Okay, what are we trying to get our social numbers to? How many brands are we trying to acquire into the, to my entity? Okay, cool. Like, what equity can I pour into this? Okay, now you want me to buy you camera gear? You want me to buy you MacBook or so on and so forth? Okay, cool. Like, you got to show me that you're doing these things so I can now pour back into you. You know what I mean? So that's how you sort of like have that conversation. I think sometimes you shouldn't, people are are nervous and afraid to have those type of conversations, but they're humans too, right? Like, obviously they make marginally more than the average individual, but they're looking for ways to expand their likeness and their brands and stuff like that too. So, yeah. Now, for you, what does that look like for you now, trying to get that ROI? Because, like, all right, let's just throw out a number. Let's say he says, Tristan, I'm going to pay you $100,000 to be in this role, right? You have to now be like, all right, like you mentioned just now, whatever brand deals or whatever, you know, my ex and my social following, like you have to be able to get that ROI in some form or fashion. So for you, what does that look like um, as far as what your actual role looks like with Fred, responsibilities and whether it's brand partnerships and things like that, like what does that what does that process look like for you in China? All right, now that we have this contact contract that I'm working with you, Fred, this is what I'm doing to kind of put back into your portfolio or add to your brand or add to your awareness. Like, what does that process look like for you and responsibility look like for you in trying to generate that ROI? I think um, you have to stay honest. I think like coming from a corporate standpoint, when I say corporate, team is still corporate. You know what I mean? Like you you have people to respond to and stuff like that. So. Um, coming from a corporate background, I think the first thing I did when me and Fred and his uh, manager Quez sort of sat down, bro, I had to, I built them a deck. Like, bro, this is what our pillars are going to be. This is what I want to achieve while being here. Okay, cool. Now when I give them that and they go, okay, cool. Tristan, we're holding you to this standard because this is what you told us. So now I got to sit down and go, okay, fuck. Well, like every day has got to be a day where I'm trying to achieve these goals. Like, I'm trying to be like, okay, cool. Like, I said to Fred, I'm trying to make sure his social prowess grows on YouTube. Okay, he never had a YouTube channel that wasn't popping like that before. How do we do that? Okay, I got to sit down with Fred. Go, Bro, like, what do you really want me want to do? How often do you want me to be around to, and be in your face? Where like, or, or you're like, Tristan, you know what? This is too much camera shit. I don't want too much of this. You know what I mean? Like, we have to have that conversation. So it's like, okay, cool. This is how I'm going to get this, get to get here for you. But we got to, it's got to be a give and take. Okay, how much are you willing to give? How much are you willing to take? Okay, cool, Tristan. I like this. I don't like this. Okay, cool. Because every day for me, I'm just like, I'm like a how do I prove value person every day. I don't want there to be a doubt in anyone's mind every day where they're like, oh, this this guy's just fucking chilling. Like, right. I gave him what he wanted. I gave him the money. And now he's just fucking kicking it. Like, even like on some shit, like, sure, me and Fred might be friends, but I don't want to be in the club 24-7 with Fred all the time. Because I'm like, I want him to know I'm still working for him. I'm still his employee. As much as we're homies. You know what I mean? I'm like, I want him to know, like, I'm trying to push him far, farther, as far as possible. You know what I mean? So, um, you try to you try to keep that balance, but you got to stay honest and being like, yo, I'm here for work, and like every day it's got to be work. He can't ask me a question and I don't have an answer. Right, bro. I have more time than he does, bro. He's in the gym. He's on a plane. He's at practice. He's with his family. He's with his friends, bro. I brought you here to work. Right. And work is not just. I'm, I'm not just telling you to pick up a camera for some. People's dynamic, it might be just like, bro, just capture content in me. For me and Fred, it's just not that, you know? So it's like, bro, I gotta have you on top of shit. Okay, Tris, this is coming to my it's coming to my Instagram or it's coming to my email. Bro, go respond to that. Okay, like let me know what they said. Okay, let me know what their rate is if I gotta pay this. Okay, like let me know, you know what I mean? And you have to have that dynamic where it's like, I wanna be an asset to you. I don't wanna be a liability or like, ah, bro, I 
told Trish to do it, man. He didn't flip and finish this shit. And like, I'm on him. No, man, he can't have that. You get cut just as fast as you got brought on. So. Right, right, right. That's real. That's real. Um, can you talk about now that you have been working with Fred, like, I feel like there's a bunch of moving parts, right? Because you might be, you do a bunch of things. Like you said, you do a content, you do a branding and all that kind of stuff, right? A lot of these NBA players, man, like we mentioned with Serge, with Fred, man, they have whole teams, man. Like they might have stylists. They might have, a, you know, a business manager. They might have a manager that's kind of handling the, the day-to-day stuff, like, you know, making sure their wives and kids are taken care of and getting cars and airports and all that kind of stuff, right? What does that actually look like, you know, for the people who might not understand, man? Because I think when it comes, people don't, people always say, you know, Jay-Z, man, how Jay-Z, he always says, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business, man. You know? And I think a lot of these players, man, they're, they are whole conglomerates and businesses in themselves, man. They have whole teams surrounding them. So what does that look like, um, you know, as far as like Fred and, and I guess the collaboration that you might have with the other people who are working with him as well? Yeah, um, he's he's forward. He's such a forward thinker, man. I think like that's a blessing. Like uh, he's in such a space where he's had great role models and he has people to look up to and he has mentors where he's just like, I know Fred and Rich are really close um, at Clutch, uh, Rich Paul, sorry. Um, and obviously Rich Paul's book just came out and now Fred can go to Rich and be like, okay, like you were bronze person. Like how did that dynamic work? How did we get a Maverick Carter out of this? You know what I mean? Like how did all those things work? You know what I mean? And I think like for Fred, like he has a large ecosystem as much as he's a, a really close, quiet kept individual. Like he's got a trainer that is here in Houston now. Um, it's me and another person doing photo and video. Um, he's got a day-to-day manager. He's got a business manager. You know what I mean? Like, he's got a cook. Like, he's got all these things that are going to help him and his ecosystem get to the point where he's just got to be on autopilot. All he's got to do and worry about is basketball. And that's what you want to want to make sure that the person that's in the driver's seat just stays in the driver's seat and focus on what they want to focus on. You don't got to have them now focusing on, like, oh, bro, I got to make sure I got to go call this car and then I got to go – make sure this food is done at home and like, okay, flip, like I have a, pr- a brand deal. Like what's that supposed to look like? And you want to make sure these are just like tidbit notes. Hey, Fred, tomorrow at four o'clock, this is this. He goes, okay, cool. Cause he has to also empower those people to be roles in their, in their jobs. Okay. You know what? You got to champion this. What, what I'm asking of you to do. You're going to be my cook. I don't got to ask you. I shouldn't ask you. Oh, Hey, what's for dinner? You might, you might send me the text. Hey, for you get home at eight, eight o'clock, the dinner will be on the counter. Da, da, da. The kids' stuff will be on the right side. It should be on the left side. Your food, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I have those questions. And I think, like, with Fred's ecosystem, he has it down to a science now. He's been in the league eight years now. So it's like he's got to learn from his vets, like Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, Serge, so on and so forth. Guys who played overseas, like Marcus Saul, so on and so forth, um, where he can be like, okay, like, how did your ecosystem work? And I think it's, it's trial and error, right? Like, a lot of players, um, you figure it out on the way. You're like, okay, do I need to have a driver? Maybe I don't need a driver. Maybe I need a business manager. Okay, maybe I really need a day-to-day manager because I have so much stuff going on in my day-to-day. Okay, you know, I someone someone to like keep on top of my family and so on and so forth. Like, there's a lot of moving pieces for all athletes. You know what I mean? And some just depends on your bankroll and like what you're willing to, to pour into. But I think like if you want to push your business, and when I say your business, the player is the business. But if you want to push that forward. Like you got to have things working for you where you're not just sitting down, you're cranking those things out yourself. 100%. Um, I want to ask, man, we talked a lot about the business side and the X's and O's and all that kind of stuff, man. Um, I want to know just from a, a personal perspective, man, what are some of the favorite, I guess, memories or favorite, you know, um, I guess, stories you could share, man. It's about kicking it with Fred, the person, you know, like I remember uh, one of my, uh, the, the most memorable moments, man, I'm, when we were, had Trey on here, man, he's like, Talking about when he's on vacation, man, he's riding jet skis with Melo. He looks to the right, he's like, yo, like, I'm oh, on ski right now with Melo. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, man, I feel like that's such a cool opportunity, man. You know, and you had opportunity to, you know, work with Surge and friends and be around, man. Like, what are some of those, I guess, I guess the first thing that comes to your mind where it's just like, man, like, life that I'm living right now is, is crazy. You know what I'm so, saying? A, a big one was definitely going to Congo. Um, Congo was just like, it was just surreal because it was just like a place I never thought I'd ever go. And I was just like, bro, I'm in Congo with the Larry O'Brien trophy in the car beside me. <laughs> and Serge Ibaka's on the other side of the car. Like, 
<laughs> what are we talking about right now? You know what I mean? Like, I think just sitting down and thinking about those moments, like you have those out of body moments and you're just like, yo, this is absolutely crazy. Like if I told my younger self six years from now, this is should I be doing? I fucking wouldn't believe it. Yeah. You know what I mean, like, and I think with Fred, like I've experienced enough with Fred to know like the type of human he is. But I think like just recently, one that like really just stuck out was like, he had his signing day for um the Rockets contract with uh clutch. Um, we had a, uh, a dinner um, in Vegas at Delilah and like it was a moment uh, for me because I sat there I was capturing but it was like him his family closest friends it might have been like 15 of us in this like room and then Rich was on the right side of him um, and then because it's Vegas and summer league like players are just popping in and out so like Trey Young poked his head through the back came and said what up to him um, Jalen Green was in the room with us, like, and to see someone like be so happy on getting to influence their family by signing this piece of paper and watching everyone just fucking get happy because you you now know like this is generational wealth. Like mind you, it was generational wealth when he got was the Raptors, but like the number he got now was flipping big, big bag. So he's like, yo, I'm signing this. Like, guys, like look what look what we did. Look at how we got here. You know what I mean? And like those moments when you sit there, you're like, I'm capturing something for somebody that is such a pivotal moment. Something like graduation, such a pivotal moment in their life. Yeah. You're like, you got to sit there and you're almost like, yo, bro, this is a, such a blessing to even be in this space. You know what I mean? Just to be around people where they're getting to receive blessings like this and like show their family, like, yo, look at the work I put in. So like we could do these things, you know? Right. What is what is Fred the person like? Because I feel like watching him on TV he seems super like stoic. He's always like got that you know said face. Like, what is what is he like? You know, behind the scenes, you know, what I'm saying it's funny as shit, bro. Like, <laughs> cracks and laughs at the same jokes that we all laugh at. He might laugh at them behind closed doors, so people think that he's still stoic. You know, <laughs> what I mean? but nah, man, he's funny as shit, bro. Like, um, bro, he's human. Like, I think that's what we when people think about Kawhi, they're like, oh, bro, the guy doesn't laugh or he's a robot. <laughs> Nah, bro, the man laughs. Like, he's funny, bro. Like, he laughs at the same jokes, looks at, like, if we're looking at, like, um something on TV, we're looking at a girl, or looking at someone like, bro, he likes the same things we like, you know what I mean? And I think Fred's the same way. Like, Fred has a really close friend circle from back home in Chicago. And if you see the world, it's like if you had a close friend circle from high school, like, he keeps those same people around, like, whether they're here or when they go on, like, when summer's time, when summer hits, bro, that same group comes together and they go away, you know what I mean? And they fucking go on all these trips and they want to laugh and shit and joke. And like Fred is that individual. Like he's funny, like he's very witty. Um, the same things like like I might be on Instagram and some funny like meme shit might pop up. Bro, Fred might send a shit to me on like some joke shit. You know what I mean? Like, yo, bro, look at this. And you know what I mean? I might send him some shit back, but it's just like he's just he's he's just like any of us, you know what I mean? Like, man, just just about to be 30. So it's like he's still young as well, you know? So my brother was saying the same thing, man, because he, he was with the Clippers last year, and he was with Kawhi. He was like, yo, man, Kawhi is hilarious, bro. Like, yeah, bro, it's funny as hell, bro. People think, like, the guy's, like, a mute. I'm like, no, bro, the guy's, like, not a mute, bro. Like, he he laughs, he jokes. Like, he's fucking hilarious. He's not, like, uh, he's not quiet. Like, he, I remember what uh, Serge had Kawhi on um his cooking show. Yeah. And, like, it was my first time, like, really getting to interact with Y because – when he's in the basketball space, trust me, he's, like, really on go. Like, he's like, okay, like, this is my space to be the robot and just kill and score. Yeah. But it was having him such a lighthearted place and Serge's cooking show is just fucking lighthearted, man. It's cracking jokes 24-7. So I didn't know how that dynamic was going to work. But it's, like, his, like, monotone, like, responses to shit is just funny because, like, he knows he's intentionally trying to be funny. And if to other people are like, yo, bro, this guy's like a robot. But, like, no, he's intentionally trying to be, like, fucking hilarious. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he's, he's cool, bro. He's cool, people. Well, that's hilarious, man. So I want to ask you, man, I think it's important to talk about this because, obviously, as an African-American in this space, right, like, it's not often, man, that you get to be in these – we get to be in these positions, man, whether it's working for a team and working for somebody like Serge and Fred, right? Like, you know, for you, I think there are a lot of people that can look up to you, man, and say, hey, like, Tristan, like, you know, young black kids, man, whether it's in Toronto or in America, be like, yo, like, you know, that could be me one day, you know, and just based on all the experiences that you've had, 
Um, you mentioned a little while ago, man, like if I were told, you know, six-year-old me this, I'd be doing this, man. I, I wouldn't even believe you, you know? Like, what does it mean to you to kind of, I guess when you take a second to reflect, man, look back at the things you've been able to accomplish, um, you know, what does that mean to you? You know, how do you reflect on those things, man? Especially, again, being an African-American in this space, having opportunities that you've been able to have, um, you know, how do you reflect on the things that you've been able to accomplish to this point? Um, I think uh, I try to reflect every day um, just because when I think about the things that I've done up until this point, I'm talking from like, it's an inception, like me going to school. Okay. Now me traveling with a friend, moving to Greece, moving to New York, like going to Greece. I'm like, bro, what are we talking about right now? You know what I mean? Like, so I think like every day, like I sit down and I reflect about the journey, the steps, the missteps, the miscues, things I capitalize on things that I could have done better on. Because I think like, if you don't hold yourself accountable to something, bro, like you'll, you'll fizzle out very fast like because you'll lose yourself in the thought of like all this shit is owed to you and it's right. not you know what I mean like I think you see people that succeed and you're like ah but how did they get there I think they reflect and then and the next day they go okay cool off this reflection how do I level up on this how do I become better and I think like my goal outside of my goals and my aspirations like is to try to open a door or keep my foot in the door for everybody to step through the cracks with me. Like, I'm like a person, like I have um, a person I mentor in Toronto right now. His name is Kaizen. And just to speak to him really briefly, like this kid was in my DM for four years talking to himself. Yo, Tris, bro, this is fire. Bro, this, for four years, I responded on a random shit, like, during COVID, do you know that he's applying and about to get the my role that I just left with the Raptors? It's fucking crazy. And I tell Kaizen, I'm like, me and Kaizen are really close now. Like, he he's come to gigs with me and so on and so forth. But my goal is to, okay, you know what? I felt like I slipped through the cracks as an African American. Okay, you know what? Like, there's this like trauma trauma bonded thing with like a lot of a lot of African Americans like we're not supposed to be here like like as if we're not owed something or like we didn't work hard to get here and I'm like well I'm trying to make sure that if I keep my foot in this door if I got through I'm trying to get like 20 30 40 of us through here you know what I mean so it looks a bit more possible it looks a bit more realistic because I think when I was doing it it didn't look realistic I think um his name is I forget, he's uh Clay Thompson's uncle essentially but he's uh he works for the NBA he's a uh, He's a DP and uh, sorry, DP director of photography. And um, he had said to me something like last year at some last year, all-star week in Utah, he was like, um, someone introed us and he said, yo, you know, there is no black NBA in the game photographers. And I said, what do you mean? And he was like, so we're not talking about social. We're talking about the people that sit on the sideline with the flash strobe that flashes in the arena when they take the photos like that's designated to a team. There's not one. And he said that to me and I was just like, what are you talking? How does that make any sense? And he was just like, he said that he was one of the only first people to be a, a sideline for a team. Yep. And I was like, but how does that make sense? Like when you now we're in a sport, it looks like you see so much representation from like, okay, you've seen black GMs and black presidents and so on and so forth. And I'm like, yo, in this creative space, I thought it was more diverse than what it was. Right. It was just like, and he's like a lot older. Like he's like 52. And he was like, yeah, like, no, like there, there isn't any. And he's like, it's a conversation amongst the PA and Chris Paul and so on and so forth right now, because like, how are we trying, trying to say we're pushing this culture forward and things, the people that are capturing the sport are not even like our own individuals, you know? So I think for me, I'm just like, how do I do my little part and try to keep the door open for people that look like me, whether they're black or not. And like, I need enough people from different walks of life and different races to come through this door. So it looks a bit more diverse. So it looks like, yo, your culture can benefit off this. Now you can go and expire an East Indian person or a West Indian person type shit to like want to do the shit that we do. So. Yeah. That's major, man. That's major, man. I think that's a perfect way to, I want to, we've been on here for a while, man. So I want to have a couple quick hitters. Get sure. you, out so you can enjoy some Thanksgiving, man. We have a little sure. fun, but. Um, I think that was that was great, man. And I think that you you put that very eloquently, man, about just trying to keep that door open, man. So I definitely applaud you for that, man. And 
shout out to, to Kaizen as well, man, for, for like bringing him on, man. You know, I think yeah, that's I mean, you can bring somebody along with you. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Bro. And shout out to bro, too, for yeah. staying consistent. Four years in the DMs. Bro, Ooh. telling you, he was in there just chatting himself. But it was like, I think someone had told me one day that, like, yo, Tristan, you got to, like, not even, like, just humble yourself. But I'm like, I think sometimes when people reach out to you, it's like, it's like a, someone reaches out to a celebrity in their DM. And they, hey, bro, you're so fire. Like, oh, my God, da 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 And, like, you know the person might not respond. But, like, when they do respond, you're like, pro, oh, my God. They finally responded to me, like, yada, yada. And I think, like, someone has said to me, like, yo, Tris, like, maybe you should try to start, like, a mentorship program, yada, yada. I'm like, bro, I don't have the time. I'm still chasing my own shit. Like, da da da, da. And you're so, Everyone's so consumed in themselves, you know? Yeah. And I was like, yo, bro, this person is so fucking persistent. Like, let me just fucking respond to this shit real quick. Yeah. And... I responded, and then you responded like two seconds, full conversation. Now we're going back and forth. He's like, yo, bro, I don't want nothing from you. I just want to know how I can learn. Teach me. I'll come to gigs. I don't care to get paid. I was like, bro, this guy is so poor. He just reminded me of myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yo, bro, I got to figure out how we can sort of work into our, each other's ecosystem and shit like that. So, Hey, I hope you're taking notes, man. Listen to this, man. Be persistent, man. You know what I'm saying? Don't creep, Ask. but that can get you to a lot of places in life, man. You know what I'm saying? Just Ask. being persistent, man. Um, all right, man. So we're gonna have a couple have a couple quick hitters for you, man. Have some fun and get you one out the door, man. So uh my first question, man, you know, so you gotta say first thing that comes to your mind, man. We're going strictly vibes off the court, man. NBA summer league or all-star weekend. Man. Summer league. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Why? Uh summer league, if you're there if you're, if you're there with a team, bro, you're there for like two weeks. Two weeks of Vegas is chaos. <laughs> two weeks of Vegas is chaos. And, like, All-Star is hit and miss. Like, you could go to a city that's not that lit. Yeah. <laughs> like, it could be in a city that's crazy, but you could catch you. Like, we were in Utah last year. It was cold as shit. So, it was, like, and, like, they tried to, obviously, All-Star, they try to make it as vibrant as possible, but it's, like, three days. And, like, usually All-Star, like, everyone's got an agenda every single hour of the day. So, it's, like, you might land. Okay, might you had to follow a player or something. Okay, players got to meet and greet. Okay, now players got to warm up. Players got to go get meet with the stylist. Players got to go get dressed. Players got to go. Right. Summer league, there's off days, but you're yeah. still in Vegas. You're chilling. Okay, now we can go hit the club. We can go to a little restaurant. Like, okay, I might go mix and chop it up with my homies in the lobby. Summer league, you're there like, I mean, all sorry, they're like one day, two days, three days, you're gone. Like, yeah. oh. True, true. All right, favorite NBA road city? Phoenix. Ooh. Scottsdale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, Scottsdale, Scottsdale, yeah, definitely Phoenix. I've heard it's motion out there, a lot of motion, motion. bro. <laughs> it's crazy out there, bro. Scottsdale, I gotta make my way out there, man. I gotta bro, make Scottsdale, my way. Gorgeous, bro. I gotta make my way, bro. Okay. Gorgeous. Okay, okay. All right, so being in the sixth all this time, we're going to with the Raptors, man. We gotta get your favorite Drake memory, man. Whether it's in a counter, whether it's seeing him around the arena, like I know okay, he's so, going crazy during the championship, man. So, what's your favorite Drake memory? So, I will say, like, there is an existing relationship there already because uh, we have mutual friends in the city, and like his close friends are like my older heads where I, where I grew up. So, they're all there was an existing relationship, but I think it was cool because to people who are not from Canada, I want to say people who are from Canada too, he's still like the biggest celebrity athlete and no, so sorry celebrity um musician on the planet right so it's like when you're trying to capture those moments you know you're capturing something that millions are going to want to see later you know what i mean so i think like getting him i think i did a walk-in with him and his son like last year and um that was dope because it was like his son was sort of getting into his own getting his own like outfits off and like drake was wearing a fur coat his son's wearing a fur coat you know what i mean and they were coming through the back door and I think it was just so dope to capture, like, him in the essence being a father. You know, mm -hmm. like, he was, like, trying to get his son to, like, pop his shit. And, like, you know what I mean? So, like, it was it was cool, man. And, like, he's, like, he's the homie. Like, I think, like, for Toronto Raptors employees, like, he's as much as an employee as people that work there on med staff or some shit like that. Because he'd be out most of the games. And he'd be in the back hallway or, like, waiting outside the locker room and shit like that. And he knows a lot of other players in the league, too, right? So, like, he's a good dude. Okay. Okay. I like it. I like it. All right. So, uh, last, last quick hitter, man, last quick hitter, man. So I want to know, um, based on your time so far in Houston, so far in Houston, man, best 
spot for nightlife so far in Houston, man, that you've, or it, it could be hearsay too, man. But I know you've been to Houston on the road a couple of times, you know what I'm saying? Um, nightlife. Man. That spot. So I haven't been to like a staple that people go to like camp. I haven't been there yet. I know camp is like a staple out here. Um, we went to, I think Friends, the place I went to was Fire, where they had the show for Braun. That shit was tough. It was like, and the environment is just like, I don't know. If you're black, it just speaks to black culture, bro, because it's like, it's just like a vibe in there. It almost feels like you're just in there with your people. You know what I mean? Like, even if you don't talk, like you're just in there with your people, because it's like, you might go to clubs or shit, other places on the road and other cities, but you might be forced to listen to Top 40. Because top 40 is going to make everybody happy. But if you go to a club in Houston, like, bro, they're really trying to reach their audience, their culture only. Like, it's like, bro, we're really trying to, like, get the swag surf going, like, up at 10. Like, you know what I mean? And, like, you're going to hear some little baby, like, right after. And then you're going to hear some, like, Rilo. And, like, it's crazy, bro. It's a lot for sure. Okay, my bad. I got one more. What's the funniest, funniest, uh, funniest moment between, between you and Fred? Whether it's... Uh, a joke, uh, something that you that that he does, people will be surprised by. Um, something that I think will will people people will be will be uh, surprised to know. I would say. Um, he used to do this like scream, and I hate so he, when in Toronto he used to like headstands before games, and the first time it like threw me off guard because like I was like, you follow them with a the camera, and then dude was going through a full fucking somersault, you're <laughs> 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 just like, bro, what are you doing? And he's like, yeah, I'm telling you guys, but back up, like, and like to do like a full handstand, like on his head, but it's for like, it's for blood flow and balance, but he does it before the game and it just fucking catch you off guard. Like he just start walking and it's fucking just tumble. And he's just like, bro, what the hell's going on? You know what I mean? So like that shit is mad funny. And then also like sometimes like when you know when you have the same humor as somebody, yeah. but you got like, anything, you got to look at each other, you guys fucking both laugh. Yeah. I'm sure it'll happen. Like someone will say some left shit and it friends around. I might look at him and he might look at me and just, just fucking start cracking up. Cause you, you both know you guys are thinking the same shit. You know what I mean? Like hey. you know, person just said it's fucking wild, hey. but nah, for sure. Like we definitely have the same humor. So it's like, if someone be saying something like, oh fuck, like I'll just look at bro. And he'll just look at me. I'm like, yeah, dog, this shit's wild. <laughs> That's dope, man. So last question we asked all our guests, man, is who is somebody that we should have on the what's in your bag podcast. But Whoever you say, you got to get in your point guard bag and help us get him on the show. Um, I think you should have Alex Subers on here. Um, Subers is can speak to a lot, um, because he was on team side, worked for the Sixers for six years, and the owner of the Sixers, Ruben Michael Ruben, yep. has sold the team. Bought fanatics and now Alex works for suit. Uh, Alex works for Ruben uh, Fanatics. Mm. He, so shot he, could, party. he shot that. He shot yeah. that. Party. Yeah, yeah. I see this stuff on IG before. Yes. Yeah. So, like, he's something y'all should definitely have on the pod because he's doing a lot for for Ruben outside of fanatics, too, especially with prison reform and Meek Mill, Kim Kardashian. Like, he's doing a lot. So, like, as much as he still like captures content, I think he's doing a lot more outside of that. And he could speak to sports. He could speak to freelance. He could speak to being like an influencer. He could speak to now working for someone that is now like mixing and shaking with not just athletes, but just influential people around the world. You know what I mean? Like Ruben is very respected. So it's like to be someone that could be like, you know what? It's like, again, he was working in, we'll say like our role and he was the person at the top. And the person at the top is like, yeah, you're coming with me. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's crazy to even say. And like now he's, on private planes 24 7 with Ruben. They're going to all these places. They're enjoying themselves, but he still does great work. And I think that's definitely a person to hear a great perspective of life from. So, man, that would be lit. Yeah. Now, if you can connect us, man, that would be great, man. I would definitely oh, love to chop it up with him because I've seen his work, man. He definitely does dope work for sure, man. Oh, bro. Super tough. Say that. Say that. Now, we'll, we'll be in contact after this if we can try to set that up. Um, so, for sure. But, uh, nah, bro. I just want to say thank you, man. Because, number one, obviously, man, shout out to you for. Making time on Thanksgiving, man. I know you got uh, everybody could be you know, doing a bunch of different things, man. So shout out to you for that, man. Um, also, man, just for being a, a dope, genuine individual, man. Like just for for time we connected just on all facts, man, and just staying in touch, man. I think that I could tell from the jump, man, you were a genuine individual, always showed love, man. I think for for me, it always I always value these conversations, man. Just being able to hear people's stories, hear people's journeys, man, from a genuine individual like yourself. Your work is fire, man. I feel like obviously people 
a Washington. You guys already know, man. I love how you do the, the, the cinematic stuff, man. I think the music is always fire, man. I love how you, I love your work, man. So just one for another, man. Thank you for coming on today, man. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I, I'm going to enjoy seeing where your career goes from here, man. And, you know, you always got, you know, family here supporting you on, on, on this journey for sure. Oh, that's love, bro. I appreciate you, dog. No doubt. No doubt. All righty, guys. This has been another episode of the What's In Your Bag podcast presented by Bet Online. Like I said in the beginning, man, make sure you subscribe, man. Give us a thumbs up. It goes a long, long way. It's going to be my guy, Pub Tay, on the outro. Until next time, folks. Peace. Sir. Suave. Suave. I've been in my bag for a while, I'm invincible Story of a young boss, grinding shit critical Calling on my bros one time, cause you special I had some hood dreams of right rounds for my mentor Every target that I shoot is on point like a pencil Different route, change relationships, I'm so sorry Came up from the trenches and I made it, I say hardly now